Okay, let's roll it. Good evening or afternoon or whatever time it is on the part of the world where you are watching from. My name is Michael McCann. I am the Gordon Hirabayashi Professor for the Advancement of Citizenship at the University of Washington. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to another ongoing series of political science faculty panels titled, We the People. Uh, I wanna acknowledge at the uh, very beginning, uh, uh, thanks to the political science department, to our chair, John Wilkerson, to the staff, uh, to Mark Smith, and also to, especially to um, Steve Dunn, who's our technical assistant tonight, uh, and to the speakers who have agreed to join us here. The title for the panel tonight is, Is Democracy Dead? This is a curious title and historical perspective. The framers of the original constitutional design did not imagine that the new American government was going to be a democracy, which they saw as ruled by the people and endangered by mob rule, including majoritarian mobs that might threaten property, a property-based economic order. We social scientists tend to recognize that they prefer the terms of republic, constitutional republic, or representative systems of governance. In short, the governmental scheme provided for elected uh, elite representatives in a horizontally and vertically divided government so as to have a host of checks and balances impeding direct rule by the people from below and some guarantees of individual legal rights especially protecting property ownership for white male citizens the idea of democracy did thrive however as an aspirational commitment to formal equality and inclusive citizenship this is essentially what the french writer alexis de tocqueville identified as the essence of democracy in america the discourse of democracy lived on largely as cries for equality and inclusion for those who were excluded by the original constitutional order. Slaves, second class workers of color, women, indigenous persons, immigrants and the like. Slavery abolitionists embraced eternal democracy as did populist farmers and women. Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln appealed to the ideal of democracy by invoking the commitment that all men are created equal it was stated in the Declaration of Independence as a lever to reconstruct the inherited constitutional order that protected racial privilege. Democracy, he famously claimed, is a government by the people, or of the people, by the people, and for the people. The idea of democracy in this sense was critical of the original constitutional project and an aspirational principle of change. The status of the term democracy changed somewhat after World War II. Long-standing cries, or inclusionary democracy rang out during the civil rights movement, the labor movement, the women's movement, all leveraged by Cold War pressures on the world stage. With the Supreme Court's ruling that racial separation cannot be consistent with legal equality under the 14th Amendment and the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act, major steps were made toward a more democratic mode of governance in our constitutional order. At the same time, scholars like Joseph Schumpeter and political leaders heralded the new American political order as a constitutional alternative to fascist and totalitarian regimes that appropriated the title of republics. Now democracy embraced corporate economic organization, hierarchical bureaucratic forms, and still ruled by elites or those accountable to them through elections with odes now to formal equal color and gender blind citizen rights. The new more democratic constitutional order was heralded as a model for a free world. So democracy is a problematic and contested idea, one that has played out differently throughout American history, including the present period. Whether democracy is dead, our question for the panel, is less the question perhaps than whether we have become less democratic or must become more democratic in the sense of commitment to equality, inclusion, human rights and rule of law and rule for the general good. The talks tonight will address the question of whether a form of government uh, is failing us. Is it too democratic? Is it not democratic enough? Do we need to think beyond the framework of democracy? So now we move on to our speakers. We have three speakers tonight and I will introduce each of them before they give their talks. We've asked them to speak for about 12 to 15 minutes each. And when they're all done, we will open up for questions in exchange. You can use the Q&A button to ask questions. Um, and I will try and keep track of them. We probably won't be able to answer all of them, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, we do ask that you ask questions rather than make statements and that you ask questions in a precise uh, and pithy 
way uh, to use as few words as possible. Okay, the first speaker tonight will be Professor Jamie Merrifield. Professor Merrifield is a political theorist who specializes in research and study of human rights. His talk addresses questions about how our inherited institutional arrangements of governance have thwarted effective policy development and implementation regarding climate change. His talk is titled, Who Destroyed the Climate? Would Democracy Have Saved Us? Questions from the Future. Professor, Professor Merrifield. All right, well, uh, um, I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, and I really wanna thank uh, Michael McCann for that uh, excellent introduction, giving us the, the historical context uh, for the, uh, the problems that we'll be raising in our comments. Uh, before I present my own remarks, I also want to say that we uh, are lucky in the Department of Political Science to have two outstanding scholars of environmental politics and climate policy, Professors Karen Litvin and Asim Prakash. Uh, and we're also fortunate to house the excellent Center for Environmental Politics directed by Asim Prakash. We are in a climate emergency. I've titled my talk, Who Destroyed the Climate? Would Democracy Have Saved Us? Questions from the Future. But in fact, these questions apply now. Human activity is causing a global temperature shift of unprecedented speed. And this together with other environmental harms is causing mass extinction of plant and animal species, along with desertification, floods, fires, droughts, ocean degradation, topsoil erosion, pest invasions, rising seawaters, and agricultural disruptions. The average temperature has already increased 1.1 degrees Celsius. What do you think about when you think about climate change? I sometimes think about people drowning in their basements in New York and New Jersey. We'll remember that hundreds of people died from the uh, heat wave in the Pacific Northwest this summer, just as hundreds of people uh, were killed in the California forest fires and floods in Germany, all linked to climate change. Right now, today, unprecedented flooding has cut off Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, from several transport connections. And also right now, there is a food crisis in the country of Madagascar that experts are calling the world's first climate change famine. Things will get even worse. In 2018, the United Nations concluded that in order to avoid catastrophic damage, the world must limit temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that in order to achieve this, total greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced by 45% by 2030 and brought to net zero by 2050. Nonetheless, except for a brief downturn caused by the pandemic, greenhouse gas emissions have increased every year and the world is set on a course to blow past the 1.5 degree limit. If, and it's a big if, if countries meet the reduction goals pledged at the Paris and Glasgow conferences, the world temperature is expected to increase 2.4 degrees Celsius. But if countries continue current policies, the world temperature is expected to increase somewhere between 2.5 and 4 degrees Celsius, with 3 degrees Celsius considered a likely outcome. Such an increase will lead to far more flooding, far more extreme heat, large parts of the planet rendered uninhabitable because of extreme heat, major crop losses and fisheries depletion, widespread water shortages, possible collapse of marine ecosystems, massive local extinctions, the melting of Greenland ice sheets that could cause several meters of sea level rise over hundreds or thousands of years, and a higher risk of tipping points after which continued warming will be caused by warming itself. There will be massive animal suffering and natural devastation. 
and major social and political upheavals can be predicted. So in other words, we are already destroying the climate and worse destruction is in store. I ask who destroyed the climate? So I want to mention three influential and important answers. And I'm going to say that I think they're all true. So one answer is that humanity destroyed the climate. Climate change was a test for humanity and humanity has failed. We have proven ourselves too self-interested and too short-sighted to rise to the challenge. We have not summoned the moral responsibility needed to confront the related challenges of collective action, intergenerational justice and climate justice. One theorist who presses this argument is the University of Washington philosopher, Stephen Gardner. He doesn't say that this alone explains the climate crisis, but he says it's a significant factor. So one answer, humanity caused the, uh, uh, destroyed the climate. A second answer is that I'm a minority of humanity, what we might call the extractive elite destroyed the climate. The political theorist Elizabeth Ellis, the journalist Kate Aronoff, the political scientist Leah Stokes are among many, many others uh, who emphasize, or among many, many scholars who emphasize this explanation. So that's the second answer, a minority of humanity destroyed the climate, a small minority. A third answer is that the current political and economic arrangements um, that we have namely electoral democracy and capitalism, destroy the climate. And this is because they redirect attention from long-term interests to short-term gains, and because they encourage self-interested and parochial motivations at the expense of justice. And many scholars have pressed this account. So I tend to think that all of these answers are true alongside other answers and that they are related to each other. Uh, but I'll use this opportunity to emphasize the second answer, the responsibility of extractive elites. Climate action has been energetically obstructed by a coalition linking fossil fuel companies, right-wing media, right-wing think tanks, hardline libertarians, and Republican Party leadership, practicing a politics of denial and delay. We know that for decades, the fossil fuel industry has waged a deliberate disinformation campaign modeled on the deception campaign of big tobacco that's designed to confuse and paralyze public opinion. Its talking points have been circulated by Fox News and Republican Party leaders and internalized by Republican voters who believe what party leaders tell them. And when I say all this, I'm not indulging in rhetoric or exaggeration. I'm simply reporting the solid findings of social science research confirmed many times over. We can see these forces coming together in the figure of the fossil fuel billionaire, Charles Koch, head of Koch Industries, who as a young man steeped himself in hardline libertarianism and with his late brother, David Koch, assembled an empire of think tanks and political advocacy organizations, which they relentlessly deployed to obstruct climate action. Aside from promoting climate disinformation, Koch Industries has pressured politicians from the local to the national level, and it has successfully disciplined the Republican Party by supporting or threatening to support primary challenges to any Republican incumbent who steps out of line on the climate. Excuse me. Charles Koch is one person who has inflicted tremendous damage on the planet and is threatening our future. I think that one thing that political theorists can constructively do is to directly and respectfully take on hardline libertarian arguments that have been used to obstruct, to, to obstruct climate action. Many people are persuaded by those arguments. So it's not sufficient as progressive academics are sometimes tempted to psychoanalyze or ridicule people who believe 
those arguments. We need to take those arguments seriously and we uh, need to point out where they go wrong and why. We also need to uh, become aware of new forms of cli climate denialism. Uh, this is uh, a theme emphasized by Kate Aronoff um, because climate denialism shifts over time uh, and the new, form, new versions of climate denialism concede the fact of human caused climate change, but they propose solutions that are manifestly ill-suited to the problem. Now, there's emerged a scholarly debate whether democracy or authoritarianism is better suited to solving the climate crisis. And lots of books and articles have looked at this question. It's sort of an unsettling question um, because it says democracy may not be adequate to this task. My provisional thought, it's just a provisional thought, is that whereas many democracies have failed to take the climate crisis seriously, authoritarian regimes have generally done no better. The current threat to democracy in the United States is the Republican Party, whose leader, Donald Trump, tried to overturn the results of the last election, and Republican officials are now busy trying to dismantle uh, institutional safeguards that held uh, Trump's uh, efforts in check. But if we wind up with the Republican Party dictatorship, that dictatorship will have no interest in tackling the climate crisis. The current democratic deficit in the United States is actually an obstacle to climate action because our political system is rigged in favor of conservatives, thanks to anti-democratic anti features such as the malapportioned Senate, the distorted electoral college, gerrymandering and voter suppression. So our rigged political system is a huge problem, uh, but I doubt it's the whole story since other electoral democracies such as Brazil, Australia, Canada, and the province of Alberta have also been major obstacles to climate action. So I suggest that we give democracy a try with the understanding that the climate crisis is a test for democracy, one that we could end up failing if we don't get our act together. So what, we, so what should we do? Uh, here are some scattered thoughts. Uh, the political theorist uh, Michael McKenzie at the University of Pittsburgh uh, has just published a book called Future Publics, arguing that the way for democracies to tackle long-term challenges like the climate crisis is to, is to build deliberative democracy, meaning practices that base political decision-making on reflection rather than impulse. If we slow down, pay attention, become informed and focus, we can demonstrate, and he says, argues, will demonstrate a concern for the future. His proposals include posterity impact statements and a second legislative, cham a second legislative chamber of randomly selected representatives with an explicit mandate to represent the interests of the future. Another democratic avenue is to build strong social movements. The journalist George Monbiot, trying to come to terms with the disappointing outcome of the Glasgow conference, uh, wrote an article in the Sunday Guardian, arguing that on the basis of recent social science research, a committed minority of maybe around 25% of the population may be what is needed to trigger a domino effect that could lead to dramatic policy change. This underscores the importance of social movements like the Sunrise Movement, Extinction Rebellion, and here at the University of Washington, Institutional Climate Action, movements that can galvanize public attention and potentially sway broad swaths of public opinion. And I wanna note that the Sunrise, Sunrise Movement uh, has been notably effective in pushing the Democratic Party to take climate change more seriously. I'm going to close with the theoretical claim that I can really do no more than assert that climate action, democracy, and justice are inseparable values. Justice is the overarching value that tells us climate action is necessary because it is justice that requires us to avoid preventable destruction. Once we recognize this, we must attend to all forms of destruction, giving priority to the most vulnerable, noting historically entrenched structures of oppression, 
and extending our concern to future generations, as well as to other animals and the natural world. On this topic, I recommend uh, the foreign policy article, The Case for Climate Reparations by uh, Olufemi Tairo and Beba Sibralik. Democracy is bound up with climate action and climate justice because the legitimacy of democracy is rooted in its connection with justice. Democ democracy is the most legitimate political system but it is founded on the idea that all people share a capacity for a sense of justice, of choosing right over wrong. Will democracy live up to its promise? The answer really depends on what all of us, including you and me, decide to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie, and wonderful talk, and thank you for staying right dead on the time that we agreed on. That's great, appreciate it. By the way, we have a couple of questions. Can you see the questions? I mean, I'm gonna save the questions until after all the speakers um, are done, and then I will try and hold on to them and pose the questions either for the individual speakers or for everybody, okay? All right, um, our next speaker, let me get this straight here is Associate Professor Jack Turner. Dr. Turner specializes in the study of political theory and American political development. He turns to address the practices of citizenship that are essential to democratic governance and culture, which arguably are eroding or at least endangered in the present period. His title, The Discipline of Democratic Citizenship and the Dilemmas It Creates. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks very much to Michael and thanks also to Jamie for that very uh, sobering but also very enlightening uh, presentation. The title of my presentation tonight is The Discipline of Democratic Citizenship and the Dilemmas It Creates. I want to emphasize from the beginning that democratic citizenship is a discipline involving three duties that are tricky to balance. First duty is to give thought to the question, what is my idea of the good society? What is my idea of the just society? Though this seems like a philosopher's question, it strikes me that if any citizen is going to vote, donate, volunteer, and discuss politics intelligently, they must have some overarching idea of what makes a society good or just. They must give thought to the idea of whether government is necessary. And if government is necessary, what kind of government is best? They must have a theory of the economy, even if it's only basic. Does an unregulated market economy maximize the public good? Or a command economy? Or something in between, such as an economy where the government provides everyone a basic income, but then lets regulated capitalism play itself out? Should government concern itself with economic inequality, setting a cap on the amount of inequality citizens may experience, such as in Plato's laws where the richest citizen may only have four times the amount of wealth as a poor citizen. The duty to think through these questions extends from the general ethical duty to think through your actions, as well as from the specifically democratic duty to take responsibility for society's basic constitution even though you're just one of many. The second duty of every citizen is to deliberate fairly with your fellow citizens, to listen with an open mind and an open heart to people with different ideas of the good or just society, to reason with them, and if you cannot reach agreement, to compromise with them. This duty stems from the general duty to respect people's equality, even when you disagree. The animating thought is, I am only one person, and they are only one person. Even if I think my ideas are better, I'm a fallible human being and may be wrong. They have reason and insight and may be right. I don't have to surrender my ideas totally, nor should I force them to surrender theirs totally. Let's meet each other halfway. Then let's revisit the issue after time has passed and we both know more than we do now. The second duty of democratic citizenship acknowledges both the inevitability of political differences 
and the fallibility of all parties involved. Being willing to listen and compromise is the only way different people can be part of a common public project. Being willing to listen and compromise is how we pay tribute to each other's equality, even when we disagree. The trouble with a second duty is that it sometimes conflicts with the first duty. If we are overly eager to listen and compromise, we can lose touch with our own ideas of goodness and justice. Or if we are overly invested in our own ideas of goodness and justice, we can become arrogant toward those who oppose us. It is easy to err in either direction. There is therefore a basic instability built into the practice of these first two democratic duties. The trouble becomes even greater when we bring in the third duty of democratic citizenship, never to compromise on the basic preconditions of democracy, especially when it comes to honoring the basic rights and dignity of others. There are some absolute wrongs we should never tolerate, murder, torture, enslavement, the detention of unpopular minorities, child abuse, and the usurpation of democratic government. These are wrongs so great and so obvious that no conscientious person may let them slide. We may sometimes even use force to stop these wrongs. The problem is that people of good faith can differ in their definition of absolute wrong. Is abortion murder? I personally don't think it is, but I can also see how someone would, and I will defend their right to profess that opinion. Would I allow them to interfere with the lawful operation of an abortion clinic? I personally would not. But if I believed abortion was murder, I could see myself peacefully occupying an abortion clinic to prevent it from operating, so long as no one was harmed. Then again, many people would reasonably argue that depriving a woman of access to an abortion clinic when she decides she needs one is by itself harmful. Here we see how conflict, perhaps even tragedy, are built into the substance of democratic life. This is not a glitch, but a feature of democracy. Instability inheres in democracy. The question becomes how citizens should fulfill their three democratic duties when they conflict. Discipline here is needed. A person's sense of justice must be their bedrock. If they abandon this, they lose their integrity. At the same time, if they adhere too strictly to their sense of justice, without any sense of fallibilism, without any thought that they might be wrong, then they leave no room for even listening to others, let alone compromising with them. At the same time, if they always compromise, if they always seek the middle ground, they risk caving to illiberal, anti-democratic forms of wrong that assert themselves as legitimate positions, even when they're illegitimate on their face. What if Vice President Mike Pence had agreed on January 6 to suspend the counting of the electoral votes and allow state legislatures two more weeks to investigate the integrity of the 2020 election? Such a move surely would have responded to the large number of citizens who doubted the legitimacy of the election. It would have honored their wishes. The trouble is that it not only would have violated the rule of law, but who have contradicted overwhelming evidence that the widespread claims of electoral fraud were false. The loudest, most unscrupulous minority would have held the transition of power hostage to bad faith empirical claims. This leads to yet another democratic dilemma. If citizens are to honor each other's dignity and equality and take each other's claims as good faith in the first instance, what justifies designating opponents' claims as bad faith? and hence unworthy of recognition or compromise. Only a repeated tendency to ignore or obscure the truth. How does one recognize such a tendency? You study yourself and you know it when you see it. It is not clear to me that the United States will be able to avoid either deep democratization or constitutional breakup over the next 20 years. Large numbers of our fellow citizens don't even believe in democracy. Political scientist Karen Stenner estimates that one third of citizens in not only the United States, but across Europe have authoritarian predispositions and prefer order and sameness to the turbulence and pluralism associated with democracy. This predisposition, this predisposition gets activated whenever normative threat emerges in the form of changing racial and ethnic demographics, 
increased emigration and changing gender roles and expectations. Authoritarian personalities seek to restore order by reimposing traditional hierarchies and conventional boundaries. Theirs is a word of world of patriarchal, often white supremacist values, impatient with the disorder of egalitarianism and a prolonged process of democratic deliberation, centering the most vulnerable and the most marginalized. New class of rogue elites worldwide seizes constituency as their path to power. They promise restoration of the old order. They inflame resentment and they promote identification with a cult of raw strength. The strength too immense to be inconvenienced by political, legal or deliberative process. They fantasize of a world where they can seek gain across national boundaries without taxation and without accountability. They will finally be free of the discipline of democracy, the discipline that requires them to treat their fellows as equals, to give thought to ideals like justice, and to treat some boundaries as morally sacrosanct. They can instead indulge their every whim while their societies decay. Transnational oligarchy will supplant democracy unless a transnational democratic coalition rises to stop them. That coalition will need at its bedrock the three practices I've identified as a discipline of democracy, giving thought to justice, working constructively with equals, and respecting moral absolutes. This discipline is stern but rewarding, and at its best can metamorphosize from discipline to dance, graceful, beautiful, unpredictable, and doing honor to partners. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Um, again, we, we have a handful of questions which we'll take up after uh, our third speaker. And we're gonna turn it over to our third speaker right now, who is Assistant Professor Noga Rotem. Dr. Rotem is a uh, political theorist who focuses on democratic and feminist theory as well as affect theory and paranoia in politics. She is going to speak on the phenomena of crowds and demagoguery, and returning us to the concerns of American constitutional founders, picking up Jack Turner's message about declining democratic discipline and connecting them to the events of January 6th at the US Capitol. The title appropriately is Democracies Need Crowds, Reflections After January 6th. Nova? Thank you, Michael. Let me just share my screen with you. Okay. Can anybody see my screen? I hope so. Okay. Um, so you have the title of my talk here in front of you, as Michael just said, um, do democracies need crowds? Uh, reflections after January 6th. Okay. So let me begin with a story. On the winter of 2021, I taught a class on modern political thought. On the second lectures, lecture, I taught this author, Elias Canetti, a Bulgarian born Jewish novelist who grew up in Vienna and in 1938 fled to England to escape Nazi persecution. In 1962, he published this book, Crowds and Power. It is a strange, fascinating study of crowds. Canetti describes there a variety of crowds from the spontaneous, just to give you some examples, from the spontaneous crowd that takes to the street, through pilgrims, panicking crowds, a crowd waiting, awaiting a public execution, even an orchestra crowd, uh, or a crowd of dancers. So these are just, you know, general um, examples of the variety and the breadth of the crowds that he studies and describes and typologizes. He also offers some of the best descriptions, in my opinion, um, of what exactly it feels like to be inside a crowd when a body presses against body. I assigned Kennedy's book on crowds because after a year of a pandemic, of social distancing, of alienating Zoom teaching, and after the protests of summer of 2020, I thought it would be appropriate to pay some homage to crowds. 
As political theorist James Martel puts it, quote, one truism in this pandemic is that it has made us all miss other people, not the people in our pod or bubble, and not even the friends, family, and fellow workers that many of us see on Zoom or other platforms. What people miss is just, uh, just other people, period, the crowd, masses, social closeness, as opposed to distancing, end quote. And so I realized that there really isn't a better candidate, as far as I was concerned, to celebrate crowds with than Canetti. Here, for instance, is how he describes his own experience as a student in Vienna, witnessing the Workers' July Revolt of 1927. He says, that was 46 years ago, and the excitement of that day still lingers in my bones. It was the closest thing to revolution that I had physically experienced. A hundred pages would not suffice to describe what I saw. Since then, I have known very precisely that I need not read a single word about what happened during the storming of the Bastille." End quote. I was particularly drawn to Kanati's intimate knowledge of the crowd and his appreciation of the exhilaration people might feel inside a crowd, the joy of being and acting together with others. Kanati classifies crowds, as I said, he explains the lure of the crowds, and he praises crowds. And on that cold January morning of 2021, I praised the crowds to my students together with Kennedy. Then to complete the story, class ended and I casually sat down to read the news. And this, and this, and this is what I saw. Yes, timing is everything. And it just so happened that I taught Kennedy on the day of the insurrection. So how should we think about Kennedy after January 6? This question haunts me ever since. How should, we how should we think about crowds in democracy, their promise and their dangers? Or in short, should anyone read, let alone assign Kennedy ever again? I want to argue today that the answer is yes, that Kennedy is actually relevant and useful to our thinking about January 6, and that we should not only read Kennedy, but but also be like Kennedy, as I will explain in a moment. Obviously, January 6th is by no means the first moment in history where we witness the destructive potential of crowds. In fact, a long tradition of Western political thought, perhaps starting with Plato, who likened the democratic crowd to a fickle beast, has been deeply disturbed and unnerved by the unstable and violent nature of the crowd. Fast forward to modernity in the aftermath of the French Revolution, and particularly after the Commune riots of 1871, a brand new science emerged, a science of crowds, crowd psychology, it was called, um, a discipline dedicated to studying the mystifying crowd's mind, and which treated crowds as be wild or cheap, hysterical and insane, and or as driven by animalistic instincts. This is the scholarly background against which Canetti writes. In fact, Canetti's appreciation of crowds is so impressive precisely because everything about his personal biography primed him to become just another crowd psychologist. As a Jewish refugee who fled from the Nazis, he knew all too well what kind of atrocities crowds are capable of. He could have just argued against the crowd like the other crowd psychologists before him. He had every reason to do so. Nevertheless, like a moth to a flame, he, come, he came so close to one of the vehicles of his own destruction. This is an amazing display of intellectual courage. In brackets, I wanna say to the students in the audience and actually to all of us who study or consume politics, um, I wanna say be connecty. That is step out of your comfort zone don't be so defensive. Allow yourself to be touched by what threatens you. Okay, now that I'm done preaching, I want to ask, so if we were, if we were here today to exercise being Kanetis, what would we learn about January 6th? I want to focus on just one aspect of it in the interest of time, and that is the relationship between the crowds and their leaders. So before Kennedy, the motto of crowd psychologists was, was no leader, no crowd. The crowd, they asserted, was just a servile flock that is incapable of ever doing without a master. 
the assumption was that the crowd craves the authority of the leader and that under the leader's influence, the crowd is hypnotized, given over to his will, what crowd theorists call suggestibility. Enters Canetti and practically throw the, throws the leader out the window, almost. It is fascinating to note that in this book that appears in the aftermath of fascism, there is no mention of the leader before around page 300. No leader, no crowd? Nope, says Canetti. The crowd, he says, wants to be a crowd before it even heard of leaders. Why? For Canetti, it is because all who belong to, to a crowd get rid of their differences and feel equal. He says, quote, it is for the sake of this blessed moment when no one is great or better than another that people become a crowd. A head is a head, an arm is an arm, and differences between individual heads and arms are irrelevant, end quote. Once a crowd is formed, quote, we hurry to be there where most other people are. Freud and other crowd psychologists argue that we hurry to be there, one with, um, be one with the crowd because we are seduced by a charismatic leader who we idolize. For Canetti, we, we hurry because we want to be close to one another. So what role does the leader play after all for the crowd? The leader is nothing more than a structural prompt for the crowd. He utters slogans to the crowd. The crowd on its part needs these slogans, consumes them, but only in so far as the slogans help keep it together. Canetti says, quote, a speaker can insult and threaten an assemblage of people in the most terrible way, and they will still love him if, by doing so, he succeeds in forming them into a crowd, end quote. That is to say that for Canetti, all the crowd wants as I said, is to remain a crowd. Rather than saying that the existence of the crowd is dependent on the leader, Canetti in fact says that the leader is in the lookout for crowds. Canetti in fact vilifies the demagogue, saying that he suffers from an illness of power and that one of its manifestations of this illness of power is that the leader is obsessed with numbers. More subjects, bigger palaces and tombs, larger inauguration crowds, how does all that has to do with the insurrection with January 6th? Trump, as we know, encouraged his supporters to march to the Capitol. We're, we're going to walk down and I'll be there with you, he memorably said. And then he wasn't. Trump obviously did not read Kennedy, but did he perhaps sense that if he does go with them, his unnecessariness to the crowd might become a bit too apparent, that he may become just an addendum to the crowd, that he may disappear in the crowd. Before you object, let me say, I know, it sounds crazy to argue that the Capitol rioters were not particularly influenced by their demagogue. Of course they were. We know that those who planned violence believed that they had orders from the president, that Trump's lies about the election radicalized his supporters, that as a recent story from the Washington, Washington Post puts it, Trump was the driving force at every turn as he orchestrated what would become an attempted political coup in the months leading, to January, leading up to January 6th, calling his supporters to Washington, encouraging the mob to march on the Capitol and freezing in place key federal agencies whose job it was to investigate and stop threats to national security. End quote. Maybe what Kennedy's deflation of the role of the, of the leader tells us, however, is that if we pay too much attention to, to orange demagogues, we may forget to explain the crowd, its project. Kennedy's insistence that the crowd has its own life and project prior to or in excess of its relationship with the leader also reminds us that, as John McClellan put, puts it, quote, the crowd cannot be blameless, end quote. Rather than being hypnotized, duped, or rather than following orders blindly, Canetti would say that the Capitol mob knew exactly what it was doing. They came to the Capitol in the name of a white supremacist project. Political thinker Hannah Arendt, who, like Canetti, was a Jewish refugee, refugee who fled the Nazis, might be helpful here. Arendt, like Canetti, was also very interested in investigating what happens when people rub shoulders in the public sphere. 
and she studied crowds in contexts ranging from the French Revolution to the Nazi mob to the ancient Greek city-states. Nevertheless, crowds is not a word Arendt often uses. Instead, she writes about what she calls action in concert. Political action in concert means, according to her, joining with others across differences. When we take to the streets in protest, when we join student groups, when we organize, run for office, we act with others across difference, says Arendt, expressing concern together for a, for a common world and engaging and agreeing, sorry, to share the world with others. And that's exhilarating, Arendt says, but it also takes political courage to share the world with others. The January 6th mob was exhilarated too. In fact, Traffing in a terminology of revolution, as some of them did, they seem to have wanted to reclaim the democratic public sphere, but without the democracy. They came to stop the steal, which is to say, to insist on their right to rule without, as Juliet Hooker aptly puts it, describing white grievances, without being ruled in turn. Less than two decades after the Nazi death camps, Arendt attended the trial of Adolf Eichmann, one of the major organizers of the Holocaust in Jerusalem. There, or in her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, she makes the remarkable claim that the real foundation of Eichmann's crime wasn't the mass murder which he helped carry, carrying out. Instead, the real foundation of the crime for Arendt was Eichmann's refusal to share the world with others. As though he, and, oops, sorry, as though he and his superiors had any right to determine who should and who should not inhabit the world. The capital rioters might have enjoyed going through the motions of acting in concert, but they, ref but they refused to share the world with others, especially across lines of race and ethnicity. And it's for this reason that we should say to them, as Aaron says to Eichmann, you refuse to share the world with others, hence we, refu we refuse to share it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Noga. Okay, we um, have a number of questions that have been asked and people should feel free to ask I see some more are coming in. Um, and I wanna try and put some of the questions together. Uh, Sean Smith writes, democracy dies and citizens lose, lose faith in its systems and processes. It appears the faith in those systems and processes are at an all-time low. Um, what does the panel believe is the source of this eroded faith? And then put some parentheses, media, mass media, political parties, foreign governments, education. And what does this panel suggest Americans do to rebuild faith in democratic systems? Another, an anonymous attendee also writes, given the importance equal power of every vote in democracy, the widespread use of gerrymandering across the US isn't democracy already dead. Isn't it more accurate to say that our political system is a mix of democracy and authoritarianism. And, and I'm gonna put those together to sort of pose a question about institutional connections, the institutional framework in which politics takes place in the recent period as opposed to in the past. Is this one where mobs, uh, is there a reason why mobs will flourish in this context more or in a different way than in the past? Um, Professor Merrifield did talk a bit about institutions um, and, and that, uh, that made it difficult for um, action on climate change, but it's mostly about particular actors who either were acting or weren't acting against climate to take action or were not acting. Um, and there wasn't a lot of, and while well, Professor Turner talked a lot about relationships and practices among citizens, there wasn't much about institutionalism. So I just want to put that together. Do you have any thoughts about the changing institutional context in which public life, politics, public communication, public interaction, all of that is taking place now, say, as opposed to what many people think was the high point of democratic constitutionalism in the post-World War II era? Anybody can take that up. That's a big question. But I mean, I, I do have something to say to that and that, you know, I've long thought that our U.S. federal constitution is outmoded, um, that, um, you know, the uh, a 
you know, Senate that gives equal apportionment to states was appropriate for uh, a, a, a federal union in the late 18th century where, um, where states at that time were more akin to what we would call nations today. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there's the issue of equal apportionment in the Senate, which I think is highly anti-democratic. Um, there's the issue of the Electoral College, which, you know, has produced um, counter-majoritarian outcomes in a number of recent elections. And, um, and moreover, you know, there is this, uh, there is just a sense of this mismatch between, you know, our current constitutional system and, uh, and the conditions of modern life. I mean, my fantasy on that is that, you know, a new constitutional convention um, the difficulty with a new constitutional convention is that there, there's still this sort of aura around the constitution. It is, it is seen as being sort of this, this uh, bastion of stability. And one of the few things that many people of different political persuasions can get around. Um, so even though I think that uh, we need a new constitution, the new constitutional convention is inapt, part of the reason I, you know, focus on my presentation on relationships among citizens and among citizens on citizenship itself um, is that, uh, you know, it, we're not in a, it does not seem that we as a nation are in a place where a new constitutional convention could work productively and that there has to be some um, preparation of the ground uh, culturally and preparation of the ground socially before that could be a productive process. So I think part of the reason I was avoiding um, um, discussion of institutions is that there are so many um, prior questions having to do with political culture and um, political ethos uh, that need to be addressed, I think, before a lot of the institutional questions can be productively solved. Sure. I mean, I'll just say a few obvious things, which is, yeah, um, I mean, the US system has, it has, a, as I mentioned, really serious democratic deficits. The Senate is just a mess um, because of, uh, you know, just the wild uh, uh, failure to represent people equally. Um, so when you think about that, um, and then um, you think, is, is the US a democracy? It's, I mean, it's, I don't think it's quite a democracy, but it's not not a democracy either. Um, and, uh, gerrymandering, I think, is a really disturbing practice because it's a deliberate attempt to um, uh, disqualify, exclude a particular political perspective, uh, a political, a particular ideological uh, uh, a point of view, and that has to be. I mean, I think it's. I mean, I think that's a, a violation of the constitution we have, because it's clear that the constitution we have is committed to. A Republican form of government and a Republican form of government meaning um, one based on the people is not doesn't exist if if some of the people are systematically excluded. So um, I think it's you know it's a mixture of betraying our constitution and having a highly defective constitution. Jamie, to return to the original question, do you think that gerrymandering actually not only diminishes democracy but makes the United States somewhere between authoritarianism and democratic, or in other words, contributes to more authoritarian tendencies? So, I mean, that's a good question and I'd like to have a better answer. I think, I mean, you could answer it, I suppose, in two ways. One, it's, an, it's anti-democratic in the sense that the, my, the, the disfavored party has to sort of reach a higher hurdle uh, in order to get, uh, uh, in order to win political power. Uh, so that one party only needs to uh, achieve a, a, a big minority of votes, whereas another the party has to achieve a super majority in order to achieve political uh, uh, power. So that's, that's anti-democratic. Um, but it doesn't close off you know, political space entirely. So Could your answer be different if it was a democratic party that was doing most of the gerrymandering instead of just a little bit of it? Um, well, I mean, I think it would still be a problem. I mean, it would be less of a problem for certain issues I care about, but, but it would be, it would be a, it would be a, a democratic deficit, I think. Okay. 
Navi, do you have anything to add to this? I have a couple of questions for you, but do you want to speak to the bigger question about the institutional context? I mean, after all, I mean, Arendt had a lot to say about institutional structures and the institutional construction of the public realm where what she called action, something like democratic participation took place, and that what totalitarianism did was erode those sort of intermediary institutions. So I'm just sort of connecting that thought to what you're talking about. Um, sure, yes, I can. I'm ha always happy to speak about Arendt. <laughs> um, so, but I actually had a, a different thought. Um, well, maybe before that, but I can connect it back to, to Arendt. Um, something in terms of, um, in response to the question about institutional changes um, in comparison, when we compare um, the aftermath of World War II and nowadays, one book comes to mind, uh, a contemporary book by a political theorist, and that is uh, the book Public Things. Uh, by contemporary political theorist Bonnie Honig, um, where she describes a, a historical process not so much starting in the aftermath of the World War, of World War II, but later on um, of the attrition, um, not just of public institutions, but also public institutions, but of something larger than that. And that's a con concept that, that she actually borrows from Arendt. Uh, and that goes back to your second question, Michael, public things, so public things, um, are laws, institutions that we share in common, but it can also be um, uh, ever, everything that we share in public. So it could be sewage system, it could be public libraries, public swimming pools, um, and so on and so forth. The, the list is, is, um, is very long. Um, and the argument that she develops there is that as a result of um, uh, processes of neoliberalization we have lost and of privatization that comes with this neoliberalization we have lost these or many of these public things and many people who could opted out of sharing these things um, in common with others um, and in a way um, we can see when when I'm thinking about crowds and about political action in concert um, we can see these um, um, these protests, these action in concert, as um, as an attempt to re um, reclaim reclaim these public spaces that have been that we have been robbed of, um, and recreate a world that we can share together with others. And by the way, when we think about the crowds, um, the mob of the Capitol riot, um, as well. Um, as other uh, white supremacist um, protests, I think it is interesting to think about the way, and I tried to refer to that briefly in the end of my talk, to think about the ways in which um, they, uh, they also are going through the motions um, of, or not also, they are going through the motions um, of claiming or reclaiming these, the public spaces where we can be with others, share the world with others as are and wanted for us, um, but minus, as I was trying to argue in my talk, minus um, this basic assumption of democracy and of action in concert that Arendt um, said is quintessential, which is plurality, like sharing, sharing the world, claiming the public spaces, but across differences with people that are not unlike us. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers some of your question, Michael. Yeah, well, um, we with two lines, there, there's a lot of questions here, and I'm just trying to find common themes. And one theme in several of the questions has to do with the role of the media in changing the kind of institutional context in which contemporary communication and political discourse and political power is really, that's one. And then a the second one has to do with whether the crowd, which sounds a lot like a mob bent on violence, uh, in, in your talk, whether the um, whether that violates the concept of the rule of law, and we have a couple of questions about um, increasing violence in society, and what does that mean, and is, uh, for the rule of law, and is the rule of law dead as democracy? So those are two questions. Why don't we take up the first one? If anybody has anything to say about the change in character of media and forms of communication among citizens? I don't think any of you are really specialists in that, so each of you can say whatever you want. Uh, 
I mean, I would actually, um, one thing I think that citizens need better practice at is actually getting distance from media. Um, and I would say I would put more of the burden on um, our educational institutions. Um, you know, we're in a media saturated environment. Um, and um, it's very easy for to let media do our thinking for us. Um, and I think students, you know, and, and people generally need more practice at um, getting away from that, you know. So, I mean, and that can mean a number of different things. I mean, for one, it could mean, you know, get off social media. Um, because, you know, one thing that happens is you be in social media, you become part of this sort of this, this loop of opinion. Um, where and where where you're asked to sort of give opinions on a you know on a very sort of quick rapid fire basis, and you don't and it robs you of time in your own life to sort of slow down, and to observe and to uh, think in a slow way, um, and I'm worried that actually our our society is becoming a, sp a space where slow thinking um, can occur, and I see slow thinking um, and the ability to patiently observe um, as essential. Uh, to the practice of citizenship and it's essential to the practice of thought. Um, so, I mean, I, I, obviously the media ne needs to, you know, do better. Um, but I think there's a lot of responsibility of, on, on citizens to um, cultivate a distance from the media that will allow you to observe with your own eyes. Well, I mean, I'll just say some things that may be obvious, but um, you know, there's better media and worse media. And in terms of slow thinking, you know, I admire the kind of journalism where reporters will work for months doing incredibly detailed uh, slog of, in, uh, of research to come up with extremely important, valuable information. So. Uh, in some ways, we live in a golden or a golden age of high quality journalism, and, and that's a blessing, and we should all uh, take advantage of it. And yet, there's also a lot of really wretched media that's that's devoted to disinformation, which comes in very many different um, varieties. I mean, it is interesting that I, I I think many people would agree that we do live in the sort of golden age of extraordinary investigative research and thoughtful research into social problems like climate change. There's just been dozens of really great investigative articles that don't always agree on the interpretation or the projection about what to do, but which are very thought provoking. And then there's a lot of the stuff that we see on mainstream both social media and mass media, which discourages thinking. I mean, I mean thinking of a rent, but I think a Heidegger, are we really thinking? We're not thinking, we're just, you know, constantly, um, in increasingly encouraged by the structure of communication in modern society to just reaffirm, you know, beliefs, assumptions, networks of, of affinity with others that have, you know, and the ideas that hold them together regardless of whether they're true or not. And, um, and both these two things seem to be going on concurrently. Um, and you know, do we have a role in education to try and shift away from one toward the other? Anybody? Well, this isn't a direct answer to your question, but I mean, to the last question, but I do wanna, there's an interesting, there's interesting work being done by the political theorists, um, Simone Chambers and Jeff Kopstein, who are looking at this problem of disinformation and what they call the wrecking of the public sphere because uh, bad media is, is you know, um, a threat to the public sphere and therefore to democracy. If people are gripped by lies, they can proceed to destroy democracy. And that's my sort of interpretation of January 6th. People believed that they were saving democracy because they were um, misled by lies into actions that threatened to destroy democracy. Um, anyway, but, uh, you know, Chambers and Kopstein say, there's sort of two theories out there about the problem of disinformation. One is that is the problem of the technology and algorithms creating addictions and then exploiting addictions and then just creating these processes that lead to the spread of disinformation. And then the other theory is just that there are bad actors out there and they say we need to give a little bit more attention to the bad actor theory 
And they point to studies that show that um, when you try, when you look at um, the sources of, of false information about COVID, um, for example, a huge amount of that comes directly from Donald Trump. So there's been really interesting studies about uh, that sort of thing. So. Anyone else? There's some questions here about forms of organization and uh, somebody, I think Joyce Cowan, I think I have the name right, asked that mobs have caused a great deal of violence, the mobs of, and of the sort that uh, Noga talked about. Are there examples of that kind of violence being led by women or is most of this by men? And does that mean anything about the politics of masculinity? And then a sort of more general question by Alison Goldberg about forms of organization, um, whether non-hierarchical movements like Occupy and Black Lives Matter and mutual aid, which are more participatory, more egalitarian, are anti-demagoguery in their, in their impulse and in their organization, whether those, um, you know, point towards an alternative kind of politics, maybe that connects with what Chip or Jack Turner was talking about is a more disciplined democracy or one that is more responsive to um, or, or uh, skeptical about, you know, false narratives and, and paranoia and so forth. Any thoughts about, I mean, again, that gets back to my general question about institutional forms, how we connect to each other matters, how we relate to each other and how we think and all that. I'll begin with no go on that actually. Okay, thank you for these great, great questions. Um, I'll do my best <laughs> to give uh, some answers. Um, so the, the gender question, um, I think that was the first that you um, um, brought up, Michael. Um, I can only answer, you know, I, um, I have not, I'm not um, doing this kind of research that um, studies, um, Kind of, you know, like his, in a in a consistent way, systematic way, um, the history or the politics of social movements. We have actually some great political scientists here in the department who um, work on these issues. But I can say that that the question that does bring to mind another political theorist uh, who makes a really interesting argument about masculinity. Um, and what he calls aspirational fascism, and that political theorist is Michael is um, not Michael William Connolly. Um, who I just taught uh, recently in my seminar on paranoia. Um, and the argument that he makes there that I think is really um, interesting and worth paying attention to um, is that there is something about uh, specific types of masculinity and specific types of um, socialization into masculinity in some um, uh, white um, um, lower class circles um, that makes people, that socializes, interpolates people, men, into um, these counter publics, into this, um, that um, through, um, in like through the very basic um, gestures of the body, like there is a certain way um, of positioning the body, there is certain stiffness to the uh, to the the back, certain uh, uh, stiffness to the jaw, certain tone of of speaking that you learn to speak in, and that you you adapt, you socialize, you learn to um, hold your body and move in space. Um, you know, you learn it through the, the correction of, of peers, you learn it through um, in your sports group, in the people that you hang out with. And the, the, the kind of argument that Connolly is making very interestingly is that he, he does research about that in the, the, um, in the Trump era, and then he compares it to research that has been done actually in the proto-Nazi Germany about the Nazi youth. Um, he, and he makes this argument about how this body, um, uh, the comportment of the body actually makes people more susceptible uh, to then buy into um, proto-fascist, or he calls it aspirational fascist 
ideologies. Um, and, and he connects that to uh, modes of, um, again, like modes of embodiment that are, that we identify with masculinity or that I ma are masculinized. Um, so that is something that comes to mind in relation to that question. I can try to quickly answer the, uh, the question by Alison or I can defer to my colleagues if you wanna ch chime in. Or I mean, I do want to chime in, but I want to hear from Noga first. <laughs> um, so, I, so I'll just try quickly um, to say um, to Ali that, um, what can I say? So, and I saw some other questions in the chat um, that had to do with that as well. Like, how should we think about crowds? How should we think about democratic crowds like the BLM movement um, with relation to the things that I've said by way of Canetti and the, the, the mob, um, the capital um, riot mob. So one thing that I'll say about leader and leaderlessness. Um, so I don't have something like, I don't have something particular again, um, against leaders. Um, I think that, you know, we, we, can, we can think about many historical and contemporary examples um, of people in democratic, in very um, like, um, in like amazing democratic anti-racist movements uh, that, that come to um, take roles of leadership. Um, and I think, so this is one thing, but I think that here we should really pay attention to Canetti who says that there is a problem in this, this discipline of crowd psychology that really um, kind of participate is participating in the, the mystification of the leader and gives it really gives the leader too much credit um, so and you know and the kind of argument that I was trying to make was that that could even be the case when we think about Trump um, even when we know all the multiple ways in which he contributed um, and instigated uh, that 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 uh, riotous um, mob, um, of course, like when I, when I think about democratic action in concert with Arendt, one of the the first characterizations that she would um, note, and that actually makes me think, um, or like maybe maybe that's an occasion to ask. Jack a question if I can if I can do that <laughs> um, is is that these um, the political action for Arendt um, one of the reasons why it doesn't follow this like structure of leader and 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 crowd that follows the leader is because for her it's by definition a spontaneous kind of action so this is um, this is one thing and. Another thing is that it's really um, unpredictable. We know how it starts. We do not know um, how it will, um, like how it will end. Um, and um, and I just, I'm, I'm just like thinking about this like spontaneousness. Um, and I, I wonder if we can think about that as um, an asset to democracy, especially to democracy in decline or in danger in this contemporary moment. Um, and I wonder if we could call that spontane spontaneousness um, impatience. What was the term that you were using? Um, not patience. It was something else. Discipline, Discipline and something else. There was something. I mean, oh, discipline and... Uh, there was something about waiting, like waiting, absorbing, not being too quick to act. Um, and um, oh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I am counseling a, a certain sort of inhibition, um, the, yeah. but it's an inhibition that respects equality. That's why that's why I'm counseling um, a certain kind of inhibition. And yet mm -hmm. it definitely is intention with sort of the Arendtian view of of. Uh, insurgency and spontaneity and transgression. Um, but part of it is the main reason is it, there's this passage in um, Arendt's on revolution that actually sort of inspires my focus on discipline and inhibition. It's when she's talking about the aftermath of the French Revolution when it turned into the terror. And, um, and you know, and she talks about the French revolutionaries imagining themselves as able who now got to slay Cain. Um, and so, and I've always been haunted by that because one of the things that haunts me about left politics, especially, is the um, the ease with which the insurgents can then become oppressors. 
um, through, you know, an excess of righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the excess righteousness, even though I identify as leftist, the excess righteousness of the, the, the left worries me um, because I think that um, a responsible politics must be fallibilist. It must be always remember that we could be wrong. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's why um, I tend to focus on discipline and limitation and boundaries uh, because I think those are that those disciplines are necessary for practicing equality. But if you're in a if you're in a, a a context of just total repression and oppression, then something more insurgent is going to be needed and is appropriate. Um, but I, I tend to agree with Jamie that the United States is in a place where it is not it is not a democracy by any means. At the same time, it is not um, an autocracy either. And so I think a, a more middling path is, is, is appropriate. But can I pick up on your point about masculinism? Yeah, because I mean, I, I think masculinism is part of the key to really sort of understanding um, Trumpism in the past five years. Um, you know, men, especially white men like myself, I mean, we are socialized to dominate space. We're socialized to dominate conversation. You know, for those of us like me who, you know, we, we, we're, we're not athletic. We're not going to dominate in the, the athletic field. We're not going to dominate on a playground. So we learned how to dominate space in class. And that's, what, and that's why we talk so much during class discussion. Um, but that's, I mean, that's how men, especially white men, are, are, are socialized in this society. And so learning how to be an egalitarian, um, it requires, I think, men especially, and white men especially, to learn how to practice inhibition, um, to learn how to inhibit your desire to, uh, to dominate the conversation. Um, part of the thing I think that, it, that why Trump appealed to so many men especially was because he appeals to, I think, a, a very deep masculine desire to transgress limits um, and to overcome what you perceive as weakness. And um, and then to 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 lord over uh, what you perceive as weakness, and so that sort of very primal masculinist desire, um, I think, was part of the 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 great enthusiasm behind the Trump phenomenon. And I think that part of Conley's diagnosis is absolutely right. It's that he was uh, Trump was appealing to the aspirational fascist in so many of us, and the the politics of identification has to really be understood. Yeah, I would emphasize the us part, not them, but of us, right? You know, we're, we all are programmed by socialization in those directions, and it's a constant struggle to try and deal with it. Um, you know, and I think that goes back to Arendt in a way. I mean, Arendt's often criticized as she wanted a polity of scholars, you know, people who are very self-critical and very learned and very careful about what they said and empirically grounded and all that. And that's kind of the challenge to, to bring that scholarly inclination into her vision of what a democratic or, you know, a public space uh, would, would be. But nevertheless, you know, and then, but that's what it's about is people who are not pre-programmed, people who are constantly self-critical and listening to criticism of others, trying to walk in other people's shoes, that kind of thing is, uh, you know, I think that's what you're getting at too. Okay, we're running out of time here. I'm, I'm gonna use my prerogative to, take on one question and then I wanna throw a final question to everybody which we've been asked, um, which is each of you to tell us what we need to do to change all this. Uh, there's a, the questions come up in a bunch of things about law and about whether the rule of law can survive or be consistent with the decline of democracy. And I write a lot about this and talk about this a lot and I've written a lot in the recent period in, in, the, in the Trump and post-Trump era. I mean, I think it's uh, the general critique that, that that the Trump administration and the Trump ethos was disrespectful in tr of and transgressed rule of law is problematic because it takes that the dominant legal um, norms in American society have been liberal constitutionalism, what we would call liberal constitutionalism, respect for rights, respect for equality, et cetera, et cetera, which is really largely a product of post-World War II era and it immediately began to, to fall apart after World War II to some degree because we have a very strong tradition of authoritarian legal traditions. We have many legal traditions. We have the law of slavery. We have the law of Jim Crow. We have a whole body of laws dealing with three ways of Asian Americans. We have bodies of law dealing with Mexican Americans, with indigenous people living in, you know, 
re, uh, space reservation spaces towards indigenous people were removed. Um, dealing with women, those were all separate bodies of law, specifically for particular people that seemed to be completely author, you know, and all of them consistently upholding the governance, the, the authoritarian governance of basically white male citizens. Now, those have been challenged over time, largely through appeals to what I call the democratic or the liberal democratic constitutional principles of, you know, equal protection and due process for all and inclusion and so forth. But it's been a contest throughout history. And, and I think the significant thing there is, uh, and I've written about this, is that uh, pr President Trump invoked those old traditions repeatedly. Those are not you know, alien to American society. They have thrived throughout American society and they are still alive. We thought that they were kind of on the run or being subordinated, but in fact, they have been reignited and reinvigorated in the recent period. So we really have a, so, and that's the dilemma of appealing to rule of law. Um, I'm a big believer in what I might call the liberal constitutional rule of law, but I recognize that that is may, maybe at one point became a dominant tradition in America, but as quickly was under assault and is eroding and so forth. Um, and that's a dilemma. I mean, when people say Trump is violating rule of law, well, that's liberal lawyers version of law, but that's, that's not, you know, what Trump is appealing to has very deep and long roots. There's reasons why he invoked Andrew Jackson who was the exemplar of authoritarian legal principles and many other you know, people, many other leaders throughout history. So it's complicated about the rule of law, but I would say we need to be more specific what we mean by, by what version of the rule of law that we are going to hold leaders to and want to be the constitutive um, constitutional um, guidance for the society we want. So that's just an answer to that. All right, the question that it's been asked, and it's sort of, I think, a thread to a number of people. Each of you could say something about what do we need to do now? Um, each of you has been sufficiently depressing in your assessment about what's going on and what has been going on and about the status of democracy. Um, can you give a quick um, answer about what you think we should do as citizens, what we should do as educators and students, uh, however you want to define that? Jamie, you want to begin? Sure. Well, wants to begin? Okay, go ahead, Jamie, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, just to pick up on my talk, um, I think what do we need to do? Uh, people need to study uh, the issue of uh, climate change. Um, they need to become informed uh, and they need to get involved um, by um, joining movements uh, that will support policies that we need in order to address this, this terrible this terrible uh, um, uh, crisis, emergency. And, um, and it's related to democracy because if, you know, if democracy is thrown out, I think at least in the US context, uh, it's going to be bad for, for the climate. Uh, so part of that means um, um, being a guardian of democracy um, and also, you know, be uh, informing yourself about candidates and finding out where they stand on the climate crisis and where they stand on preservation of the democratic institutions that we have such as they are. That would be my answer. So you don't agree that democratic institutional structures are ill-equipped to deal with the challenge of climate change as many people have argued? Well, that's just, I mean, that's a gigantic question. I think so. I mean, I tried to talk about that a little bit yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think I there. I'm trying to get you to be uh, optimistic at, at the very end here. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's why I think some of the radical proposals by Michael McKenzie to reimagine democracy are worth thinking about. Right, right. Um, that's, that's but um, in the meantime, we have to preserve certain rudimentary elements of electoral democracy if we have any hope of building, you know, a more complete democracy and of combating climate change. That's, I think that's what I would say. Okay, either Chip or Nuga, you wanna, what, what do we do? Um, I guess I'll start by saying that um, I found the transition um, uh, from the Trump to the Biden administration, I found that a terrifying epic in our political history. 
Um, I think we came very close to losing the uh, really essential norm of a peaceful transition of power. Uh, we came frighteningly close. And if it had, if it had shaded into that, I think the only thing that was going to restore it was basically a general strike among citizens. Um, and so I think in the future, there are going to be future political crises. And so my, my recommendation is, is for people to be politically networked. And that means not just online, but be networked into neighborhood associations, religious associations, educational institutions, so that you have networks with large uh, other groups of people, so that when political emergencies happen, uh, that you can respond in a robust way, in a networked way with, with speed. Um, one of the things that's concerned me about the pandemic is that it has atomized us into our households. And so as a result, we have um, I think less social capital and less political capital as a people, as a demos. And I think reinstituting those interpersonal networks is going to be really essential to staving off tyranny. Thank you. That, that was sort of what some of my earlier questions were tilting towards. That's very, I, I appreciate that in particular, what you just said. Nova? Um, I'll just say, uh, since I'm realizing I did not answer the question of my, my own talk, the, the, of the title of my talk, uh, Do Democracies Need Crowds? Uh, so just in line with um, what both Jamie and Jack were saying, um, I also would say yes, if that was not clear <laughs> from the talk. Yes, democracies must have crowds. We must be able to organize um, through the, uh, some of the avenues that uh, Jack was offering and others um, act in solidarity with marginalized uh, political groups. Um, and one of my, I, I, I would say very quickly that one of my worries in the aftermath of January 6th um, is that seeing what, what uh, this event unfolding and how traumatizing it has been for uh, so many Americans and people around the world, um, that the tendency of the public opinion and of the public in general would be to like, um, you know, kind of like take the other extreme and um, to this direction of like law and order in response to all um, um, insurgent political action that takes place, uh, democratic as well. Um, and this is something that I want to caution against. I'm a big believer in the power of protest and the power of people to take to the streets and it's, it's, it's immense political effect. And I think that we should keep doing that. Um, we've done that when Trump was president, we should keep doing that. Um, and we should be prepared. <laughs> we should be prepared to, to respond to any um, um, you know, further decline in democracy, any further insurgent um, fascization of, um, of the American um, public and state. So that's what I would say. And of course that leads us to the question that actually did pop up here, but we can't address now, but maybe people can take away thinking about what's been said today. What's the difference between Black Lives Matter and the March, uh, uh, women, Women's March? on one hand in the January 6th um, protest. Those, you know, and they've often been equated, especially by people on the political right. Why is that equation problematic and so forth? We can't answer that now. I'm just leaving that as a question that everybody should think about because it really matters. We shouldn't take what happened January 6th as a, as a um, lesson. We, we shouldn't act collectively and politically and in the streets, but what's the difference between a disciplined democratic approach to use Chip's language and what happened there. Anyhow, we have been going a long time. We are at the end of what we had projected. I wanna thank everybody in the audience who's still with us, who's been with us for a which is a lot of people. We're still over hundred people. So thank you for your indulgence. We hope that this was worthwhile. We hope that uh, we gave you at least some, some things to think about as you walk away. And again, I wanna thank the Department of Political Science for sponsoring this series. So I wish you, and again, thank our, our speakers for these lively and provocative discussions. So with that, I think I will just say good night. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks.